So, um, I, will, I will speak in English. Um, mein Deutsch ist noch nicht sehr gut. Aber ich kann, ich kann verstehen, aber das ist... Ja, yeah, I'll, I'll switch to English now. So, um, I'm Karthik. Um, I, uh, I work for SAP. And um, I also um, uh, am a Google developer expert um, in machine learning. So, what I do is I actually teach machine learning and basically uh, try to have an or you know give an overall understanding of uh, what machine learning is supposed to do and what machine learning cannot do more importantly um, uh, my role at sap is pretty much uh, working on research on um, um, machine learning uh, especially for natural language understanding and natural language processing um, and in this talk what i will basically try to do is uh, to go for the understanding of the, the basics of machine learning. So before I get into the basics or anything about machine learning, just a quick uh, check. How many of you have uh, used or trained a deep blue neural network before? OK, good. <laughs> That's good, because uh, this, is, this is going to be my follow-up question. So would it be useful to have like something fundamental? Like, uh, because what will happen with the Google Cloud study is something that you can actually do by yourself. Uh, but what I thought on the other hand is to basically go through some basics. So what is this deep neural network all about? Uh, why are we talking about deep neural networks? What is a neural network in the first case? Uh, so I think the last time uh, I was here, uh, a lot of the participants actually gave feedback that uh, it would have been useful if I actually had something more fundamental instead of talking about uh, something even more like deployment and training already. So would that be useful? Uh, OK, cool. Nice. So then, what we will do is uh, we will uh, we will come to this later. So then, I will I have like <laughs> planned two sort of uh, the streams over here. If everybody were probably much more ahead in machine learning or deep learning, I would have uh, done something completely uh, the cloud-based cloud machine learning approach. Uh, since uh, it might be useful for everyone to have like some basics, uh, what I would try to do now is uh, uh, quickly switch tabs. Um, the content is pretty much uh, similar to what Google actually presented. So this is uh, some, something from um, a Google uh, called, um, so we, we, uh, that are actually, so you will see that there is actually, this presentation was done by uh, Martin Gurner uh, from Google. Uh, so this is a wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, this is, uh, if, if you're interested in actually going through this, uh, I will highly suggest this. Um, but we will go through this quickly to understand uh, what are we talking about? What are the different jargons in deep learning? Uh, what is a layer in the first case? What, why, what is it that we are doing uh, with, say, the mathematics underlying? I'm not going to go too deep into the mathematics itself. Uh, but we will have an overview of uh, what this, uh, you know, different uh, things that you're talking about, say softmax or uh, whatever uh, jargons that we actually would you you would have heard. Uh, we will try to clarify in this presentation over here. Um, does that sound good? Cool. So. Uh, so if you saw this, uh, this slide itself, this slide is actually uh, trying to, so in general, uh, there are three branches of uh, machine learning. Uh, generally supervised machine learning, where the human being is trying to uh, give some labels, and there's input data, which is the, 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 the layer in the middle, or the, the, the model itself, the algorithm in the middle, I would say, uh, is learned by the, uh, the computer, or whatever the machine over here, the algorithm that you're going to develop. Uh, in terms of unsupervised machine learning, which is a large case that human beings also try to do, uh, is what uh, is one of the largest uh, uh, another area in machine learning where there is an active research going on. And the third uh, uh, area of research is, is reinforcement learning. Uh, so today, whatever we talk about would be supervised machine learning. Uh, the reason for supervised is because uh, in general, what we will do is we will say this is an input and what the actual label is. So this is why it's supervised. Uh, always an input and an output would be given. And uh, what the, new, the, the model or the algorithm in the middle will try to do is to learn this exact representation. So uh, to give you an overview of what that actually means, if you show a kid basically uh, a toy and basically show, uh, say, a, a, fire, a fire wagon, for example, and then uh, do, you know, show different examples, different uh, toys of the same fire. Um, oh. Uh, the the uh, basically the fire wagon and basically uh, you 
take the kid outside and then uh, to the actual uh, fire station and then you show the kid the actual uh, the the engine then what will happen is the kid would be able to naturally say that this is basically uh, the fire engine that it actually saw with the toy so you don't have to teach the kid explicitly that this real world example is what was actually taught what the kid was actually taught at home so similarly what happens with machine learning is that you have these inputs so you know that these are the various cases that the algorithm would actually see and you will basically train the model uh, with these inputs so in this case uh, what this uh, input is basically is different digits for example and uh, in this case uh, where these examples came from was basically uh, the post office uh, so where they want to sort uh, or identify the the letters on a post uh, in the envelope and basically they want to immediately identify and uh, you know figure out where it has to go to the pin code and then the inputs were basically taken from uh, different envelopes in the US and uh, there is this wonderful uh, inst institute called the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology which actually has this uh, data set so or this data itself so wh what you can do is you can go to a particular yeah in the on this page and you can actually download it yourself um, what will happen is in general there will be 60,000 examples and the corresponding label. So every example will have its label. So for example, if we take this one, so if you see this eight uh, would be different. So in this case, if you actually can see the background, you can actually see all the examples. And uh, the eight itself is a representation of uh, a particular sample, so a particular instance in this training data. Uh, what uh, so you see 28 by 28 pixels. So human beings, as and so normally we would see it as a two-dimensional uh, data. We see X and Y, and then we say this is a two-dimensional input. But in general, what will happen is uh, to the computer, it, it does not matter. These are uh, every pixel is basically a zero to 255 value. And uh, in this in this case, what will happen is uh, the computer would be fed with a, a vectorized version. So every so what how vectorized? Basically, uh, every every row you go through the 28, and then you take go, uh, row number two, take the second 28 and stack it over there. That will become so, and then you so on and so forth. You will basically get a 784 vector of pixels. And these are going to be the values from the actual input. So what happens is uh, effectively uh, you want a, any given instance you want to give to the computer or the algorithm, you want it to actually say whether it's between uh, zero or nine. So that, that's the challenge for the computer itself to learn. Uh, in general, this is where the neurons actually come in. And uh, generally what will happen is uh, you want to, in this case, this is a soft max, so you have 10 neurons. Uh, and what will happen is it's trying to just take this uh, input, which is a 784 dimensional vector, and then it's directly trying to understand, uh, it's basically getting a weighted sum of all these inputs. Basically a weighted sum is, so a WX and a plus and a B. So the X would be this input over here, and uh, uh, effectively it's trying to sum up all these values, and then it actually tries to come up with this weight, and then it's trying to say, okay, given this, it's trying to come up with a 10-dimensional vector, why 10? Because we have 10 classes. So, and it's trying to say which of these 10 this uh, given input vector would belong to. And this is, a ch this is what the, new, uh, the, the machine learning algorithm itself will try to do. Uh, so you have 60,000 such examples, which means that you have uh, 784 times 60,000. And you will feed this again and again into the neural network. And the neural network will try to learn the weights. And we will see how it's actually going to do uh, very soon. So. Um, you would have, I think, pretty much seen this case. So in high school, you would have learned about this WX plus P. And this comes in very, very handy, especially when you're trying to talk about machine learning. Uh, so in a machine learning algorithm, you have a layer, right? So a layer is typically this WX plus B. So whatever you're talking about a layer is this WX plus B plus a nonlinearity, or, or not a plus, but rather applied with a nonlinearity. We will go into detail again. So what uh, I mean is, so you take this example that we gave here. In this case, this is a W, so this is the X, right? So the X is generally the input, Y would be the output. In this case, uh, Y is the target value that we want. Uh, so we'll go come to that later. And uh, we see basically, uh, we will, in, in, I said there are 60,000 examples. Uh, it's generally computationally very expensive to do 60,000 examples at a shot. So in general, what we do is we take what we call as a batch. So in this case, we take an example of 100 uh, instances, and these 100 instances are fed. So in this case, you have 784 pixels, so a vector of 784, and in this case, 100 uh, images. 
So this is how we stack everything together. Uh, so this is one matrix. So the X matrix is basically uh, 100 by 784 uh, matrix. And the X would, uh, uh, there's the W, would basically be uh, 784 again here. And basically on the other end, you have 784, a 784 by 784. And effectively, WX is a matrix multiplication. Uh, you will get on the other end um, 100 by 784. So we will see why this is, uh, how this is done. Uh, so every image, so you take column by, this is basic uh, matrix multiplication. So what it does is it takes this um, entire column, multiplies it with the entire row, and it does so on and so forth. Uh, it does it for the, all the uh, 784 pixels. What it's trying to do is for any given, a, any given pixel over here in this column, it's trying to figure out how much of a weight would be useful for it to actually make this prediction of this uh, on the end on the other side, which is basically saying whether this is an 8 or a 6 or a 4 or a 5, whatever it could be, it's trying to say which of this, this particular input would belong to. And what this W here is happening is basically every single time it actually sees an instance, it's trying to predict what this instance could be. It's trying to say, okay, okay, you showed me some example, it will basically say, okay, this is a four. And what this neural network is trying to do uh, is say, no, this is not a four, this is a six. And what this algorithm will try to do is it will try to propagate this error back. So this is where you talk about back propagation. So you have the forward propagation, which goes from WX plus B. So on the other end, you get this L, which is this loss. So the loss itself is uh, produced from this WX plus B. And the loss itself tells how much of an, a mistake this um, uh, algorithm is making in predicting this uh, target value. So this is what is actually happening. At the, in the end, uh, a neural network is all about WX plus B. It's about how you make it, it's about how well you do these parameters, and it's about how you actually uh, do this training itself in the end. So it's all about experimentation and how you actually get these loss values. So you see basically for every single, every single multiplication you have different losses, and you have an entire matrix with all these losses and these uh, biases. So you get this bias term and you basically uh, bring a vector over here. And this is why you have, so you, what the algorithm in the end learns is this W value and this B value, or this W matrix and this B vector. So this is what it's trying to learn. So in this case, it's a 784 by 784 uh, um, a matrix, and over here, it's a 10 by 784 um, vector. So that is what it's trying to learn. So uh, having said all this, it's, 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 uh, I hope it's clear, so if there is any question, uh, don't, st uh, don't mind in stopping me, I'll be happy to answer any questions. But in general, what will happen is, we've taken one example, we've tried to produce the loss, and then now that we have the loss, we have to now say how this loss is going to translate into a prediction. And this prediction, in the end, will be the softmax. The softmax is one of the nonlinearities that we will apply. And what the softmax tries to tell is basically, okay, now you have something of some values, some losses. Uh, it actually tries to predict, uh, it tries to say, okay, you have, uh, it's trying to make this between the values 0 and 1. It's, it's basically the confidence. So in, in the end, so when you talk about deep neural networks and when you have, say, particularly an example of, say, image classification, what you would effectively do is a customer might ask, hey, uh, hey you have an algorithm which is 93% confident that it, this is actually a dog. Why is that so? And this is the reason is basically this. In the end, what it's trying to do is it's trying to predict this uh, this 100 by 10 matrix saying what exactly is behind the scenes. So uh, in, a, in a, say, a dog versus cat classifier, what it will try to do is, uh, instead of this uh, 10 um, matrix, instead of this uh, softmax of 10, you will have a softmax of 2 because you have two classes. And uh, on the other end, you will also not just have the X won't be a 28 by 28, but in, it, it would be your image resolution. So it could be 100 by 200 or whatever resolution that you will have. In, in the case of image net, it will essentially 224 by 224. There are different neural networks called Inception, which have a 227 by 227. Uh, they have their own reasons why they have 227 and 224 and different uh, image resolutions. In general, this is not going to be too, diff too, uh, too much of a problem at the moment. Let's not go too far into why we are choosing the resolution as it is. Uh, at the moment, let's stick to this 28 by 28. So effectively, like I said, so this becomes a layer. So we have one WX plus B, and a softmax is one layer altogether. So effectively, you've trained a deep neural net, or not a deep neural network, you've trained a neural network, which in this case is trying to learn this W and this B, and it's trying to apply this nonlinearity to actually predict these values between zero and one.
And uh, there is an example, uh, I think that will come later, which will actually say how well this neural network is doing on these 60,000 samples that I actually said uh, this data set actually has. So uh, when you talk about uh, TensorFlow, I think uh, the code over here is actually pretty outdated. Uh, we will go to the code uh, later on. But uh, if you were working with 1.x, generally you will be able to work on this. But the goal or the idea would be pretty simple like this. So you will have the tf.nn.softmax, uh, and the softmax will be a matrix multiplication. And effectively, you've trained a, a one-layer neural network effectively. Uh, in this case, you're, you've learned w and this b. And this is what you will save to your file system. For example, if you see, uh, uh, say something, if you download an image classifier and people talk about models, so this is a model. So what they mean by a model is this, this weight and this bias, which is persisted to file system. So in, in the end, what is happening is this W and this B will be persisted so that later on, uh, once this neural network is trained, finished completed training, what you can do is you can, uh, you can put this back and you can do new predictions. And this is the reason why you have a model which is, say, 1 gigabyte large or like 10 MB large or because of the number of parameters. So effectively, there, there, this, could, this is a floating point variable or a matrix here. It's a floating point matrix of 784 by 784 values. And uh, you have to store these two values values into a disk. So it could be a NumPy, it could be whatever, it could be a binary. And this is one of the reasons why you have uh, such a large files or smaller files. Or if you talk about TF Lite, you have like uh, neural network uh, weights which are like 10 KB or 15 KB. So it's very interesting how machine learning is actually going, going from deploying to an Arduino board to a basically a TPU uh, server. We will also show an example where you can actually do or uh, train on a TPU server on Google's infrastructure and run your own experiments as fast as possible. So uh, having said all this, so you have all the inputs that are needed. So this is a single layer neural network. You're already set to go. So you can actually train a neural network. Uh, but the challenge here is to basically uh, take this y value, and then you, you, this is again uh, something called a cross entropy, which is effectively trying to say, OK, you, you actually have some inputs. Uh, uh, this is the target value. I want to say I'm trying to predict the number 7. And uh, you are basically saying, uh, this is the value, what is the loss? So how much mistake the neural network is actually making in predicting this particular target value and the actual value that this is actually trying to predict this. And the value over here is what is going to say whichever the index is, corresponds to the actual value of the, uh, the, uh, the, the class that it, the neural network is trying to predict. So, so it's, it, this is basically uh, the prediction of success. So the higher the loss, the poorer the network is actually doing. So it's contrary to what we think. Uh, so in our case, you, I think it's like the German system probably, where you get the lower the score, better. Uh, so uh, all, all over the world, you have the higher the score, the better, uh, I think. But this is more towards the German system, I guess. You, if you get close to zero, then you're actually, of, of course, in here you, you have to get close to one. But uh, you have to, in, in this case, in a, you will try to bring it as close as possible to zero. Uh, and that is also a challenge. So generally, you'll also get into a, a quick case where if you say you have zero loss, it's also a problem because generally, because of the randomness, you will not be able to get into a zero loss value. And unless and otherwise, the neural network has actually learned everything by heart. So we will come into that later. So uh, this is something called overfitting and underfitting. Uh, we will come into the problem uh, later on. So yeah, I think I put in too much information already. Uh, but yeah, feel free to stop me whenever you have any questions. Um, I'll be happy to share any information. So in this case, if you see this neural network, uh, what it's trying to predict is, um, let me stop here. Uh, so that you can actually see what it's trying to <laughs> trying to predict here. Yeah. So in in this case, it, these are the weights and these are the biases. Uh, and over time, so in this case, it actually takes this batch of hundred uh, images at a time, and then it's trying to predict. So it, because we have hundred images at a time, uh, we have sixty batches, or in this case, uh, six hundred batches. So which is six hundred steps for one epoch. So uh, we talk about epoch. So an epoch is basically one time when this neural network has seen all the training data. Uh, so in the case of, say, for example, if we take 50,000 images to make things easy, uh, 50,000 images, a batch of 100 will go through 500 steps. So that's one epoch. And if we do one epoch, 
we would have one particular value here. So which is going to say, hey, I looked at the training data, and this is how much mistake I actually made in predicting this training data with the actual value. So I have this y, and I have this, um, this y dash, so-called so y dash, which is the cross entropy saying how far this y dash is from the y. And this is what we predict over here. This is the cross entropy loss over here. Uh, what we also, we also track is the accuracy. The accuracy is where you take, for, of course, as we know, basically you say how of these 50,000 images, how many images were matched exactly to the actual value. So this is a simple metric that we actually try to match here. There are other metrics as well that uh, we could actually match. We could match the F1, we could match the precision, we could match the recall. Uh, but to keep things simple, we will just track the accuracy value. Uh, but in general, all, almost all of these values are simultaneously um, monitored when it comes to actually training a, an image classifier, or in general, any classifier for that matter. So uh, now that we see that, we also see in this example that our, uh, it takes all the uh, cases where it fails. This is very important. So in neural networks, in machine learning in general, it's not important if you make 95% accurate uh, predictions, but you have to see where the 5% loss or the 5% failure cases are. And uh, in general, it's also about uh, normalizing the input and normalizing the output and things like that. But if you're talking about purely about the neural network itself uh, or the machine learning algorithm itself, you, you would want to see the uh, failure analysis. You would want to see how bad the neural network is doing on, say, for example, the 2%. Why is that 2% that important? It's not that you want to get 100%, but the point is you want to take care for that particular 2% or 5%. You want to ensure that uh, you can actually handle those cases very well. So there is a very classic example for this case. Uh, so is, assume that you are the doctor who is actually, say, predicting if a patient has cancer or not. So if, you're, if you say that your algorithm is 98% accurate, uh, what it means is that if you have 100 patients, you're going to tell two patients uh, so by mistake that they do not, probably they have cancer and probably they uh, don't have cancer or the other side, they don't have cancer when they actually have cancer. So this is a potential problem. And this is the reason why you do this two person analysis, this failure analysis to see what what are the cases where it will basically fail? For example, it could probably, you have, this is where you track back and then say, okay, for example, this input the, are the cases where it cannot handle well. Uh, say, in, in the case of images, it could probably uh, take an MRI and then uh, you could say that cases where there is overexposure, for example, uh, then the algorithm does not do well. Or there is underexposure where it actually does pretty bad. So these are the cases where you, this is why you need to do an error analysis. And this is why this sort of this example, uh, you have to always track, and it's not important to get 99% or 100% accuracy, but it's more important to understand your, the impact of the input data on the output results. And you need, this is where, again, uh, there is research going on, it's called explainable AI, where we actually try to uh, interpret how a neural network is actually working, and then we do that by different models. So we do a black box model. Uh, there are papers at the moment which actually talk about interpretation right in the neural network itself, built into the neural network, uh, but we are too going to far. But in general, this is why you do all this. So you feed in the test data, and then you look at the test data, you, how bad it's doing, and then you predict if it is actually good or bad. So you then decide whether you want to use this algorithm at all. Um, so to give you a brief overview of why we came to this place, I think in 2012, so the history always goes back to 2012 with deep neural networks, where there was this change in uh, this entire history of uh, deep neural network models, where uh, this ImageNet model basically just outperformed, uh, called AlexNet, which actually outperformed everything. And uh, this is the, it was always there. There was, there was, so it was basically a yearly competition. And in 2012, basically, they used the first time a GPU to actually predict uh, and basically train a neural network to predict something called uh, uh, this, this classification, image classification. And there was like a difference of 26% versus 2011, uh, the winner of 2011. And this was the reason why people actually started looking at deep neural networks pretty seriously. And we are at the moment where the image net classification is actually pretty much obscure. It does not make any sense anymore because I think the best performing model actually does better than a human being. So uh, you would have seen like articles which say a neural network can outperform human beings in a lot of cases. Uh, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, neural networks are very, very limited in what it can do. So uh, this is one of the reasons why although it could do some tasks better than a human being, it cannot do all tasks as good as a human being. So this is one of the biggest takeaways. Uh, so if someone comes and says, oh, his AI 
they're going to take over your job, it's highly unlikely that's the case. Uh, because it can do a particular task very well, does not mean that it can do all the tasks that a human being can do as good as a human being. And this is one of the biggest problems with uh, machine learning models. And I think, uh, yeah, so we, this is also somewhere, I think a bit of a digression, uh, but we'll come back to this again. Uh, in the end, yeah, so il the single layer neural network was able to do 92% accurate. So on the 10,000 images tested that we actually have the test data, we, ha we, we did 92% accurate. So this is actually pretty nice because you see with, uh, with just inputs and almost no new information that you gave. Uh, so conventionally back in say 29 or in the grad school, what we used to do was basically, uh, we used to publish papers on which features were the best. So what we are doing over here, a neural network effectively does is extract these features. And uh, this is exactly what is happening with these weights and it's trying to actually predict something and the error and all that is basically an approximation of all these feature extraction methods. Uh, Effectively, a neural network is trying to say, okay, you have this input, you have this output, this could be the best way to extract the features that could actually model this algorithm better. And that is all a neural network is effectively doing. It's a very good feature expert. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. yeah um, hope it's a quick question. Just sure. What do the contour colors actually mean on weights and biases there? Yes. So um, what this actually shows is basically the bias and the variance. So there is actually a variance in the data. There is also a deviation, standard deviation in the data. What this tries to show is basically how far the weights are when it's actually training over time. And what you can see is uh, the closer it comes over time, it actually tries to, it, if, you look, if you see the 3D version of this, you can actually see that uh, it starts with a wide uh, distribution. It's random because this is how you start with the weights. Initially, you don't know the values. You would start everything with a random distribution of this W. And over time, what will happen is it will all cluster together. These weights will come together and the biases will also come together. And over some time, it, there won't be any change at all. So it will stop learning. And this is where we talk about convergence or divergence and things like that, yeah. Um, and um, do you have tools to actually track which uh, items you failed on? Yes. Oh. You can do that. So in TensorFlow especially, TensorFlow has an excellent tool called TensorBoard. Uh, we can also see that if you want. So we will go through that actually uh, in the uh, lab itself. Uh, what will happen is uh, you can actually train a neural network. When the neural network is actually training, you can simultaneously look at the logs and look. This is actually an example which was done live uh, in uh, Martin Gurner's talk, actually. So you can run this yourself, even on your laptop, and effectively uh, learn and actually feed this information. And uh, live, uh, uh, when the neural network is training, you can actually see examples of where it fails and where it succeeds and things like that. So board does an excellent job with teaching you or like showing you how the training actually happens in real time. Uh, although it's not technically real time, I think there is a still a feedback, there is a still a delay because uh, effectively every time the model up updates, the, it's a server that's actually trying to look into this and then ping regularly, but it's close to, it's like a, there is a 60 second or a 30 second delay with which TensorBoard can actually look into the logs and then say how good the neural network is learning. So it could effectively do this when the neural network is training as well. So yeah, any other questions? Cool. So now that we have this, I think let's not get into this. Uh, so effectively in TensorFlow 1.x uh, or whatever, you would have done something like this. We, now this is much simpler. I will show you an example where uh, we will go through this in much simple details. You don't have to do all of the placeholder variable things at the moment, but uh, to give you an idea of what uh, we would have done, uh, you know, this is like back in the days, this is what we used to do like one and a half years ago. So this is already sounds pretty old, but this is what, how we used to actually train a neural network. Um, we already sound a bit old, but this is how you, need, you will generally define uh, the input variables, you will define the weights and the biases. So uh, all this is some, some sort of like uh, clear, pretty much clear. The reason why these two guys are variables are because it is going to train over time, it's going to learn something, while this placeholder is because it's going to feed this at runtime. So at runtime, it's going to feed batches of um, uh, images, or in this case, inputs, and it's going to just feed these batches, and then uh, the neural network will learn over time. This is why you have different variables. But don't worry about this. This is not something that is the current. This is not. Uh, this is completely outdated. But it's still good to know how uh, you know people of those days used to train neural networks. 
And um, yeah, here as well, you will see the matrix multiplication happen, and you will see this vectorization happen, and then you will the W and the X and the B uh, getting learned, the, uh, the W and the B learned over here. And pretty much, yeah. So you will, uh, then you will see accuracy and things like that. So this is basically an example of how the previous slide was basically trained. And uh, here you come to something called the gradient descent optimization, which is one of the ways in which you can train or learn this error. So I said there was an error, right? What the neural network tries to do is it uses uh, this con convex error uh, function to try to get to the lowest score. So this is where we want to come to close, as close as possible to zero. We will generally not come to zero, but we will, the neural network will try to come to zero as possible. And the gradient descent optimizer will try to do that. So there is a learning grade. So yeah, let's not get too in, caught up in all of these jargons. If you're interested, I will be happy to share about why all these things are there. But in general, at the moment, these things do not really, really matter until you're, unless you're actually training something in real, like something that is going to be, uh, you're going to do it all by yourself. You don't have to do all of this at all. Uh, all these are basically abstracted now. So you have APIs, higher level APIs, which do most of the things for you. All you need to do is like figure out if machine learning is actually a problem, something that's going to solve your problem. So uh, something that I actually tell people is um, machine learning could sound nice, so it could sound really sexy to tell to your customer that, hey, I use AI to uh, solve your problem. Uh, but in general, uh, I, would, I wouldn't say, <laughs> unfortunately, or you, you will have to say that, uh, because you still, it, it's still nice to say that to customers, and customers want to hear that, uh, so it, it's fine. Uh, but the point is, you should also, you should also think about the fact that, uh, is machine learning actually going to solve your user's problem? So there, is a, there are two concepts over here. A customer is a different point. Financially, it could make sense to talk about AI and machine, I don't think machine learning, you would say to anybody, you will generally talk about AI, to someone, uh, but to a user, you have to see if this machine learning would actually add value to the user. And in general, if it is going to, if it is going to be pretty easy to solve with, say, rules, uh, then it's better to not even use machine learning at all. So if you can, if your problem can be easily solved with rules, then don't go into machine learning at all. If your problem has very small, very simple data to be learned, then you can actually solve this with uh, pretty much with uh, classical techniques, classical machine learning algorithms. Uh, the thing where it can actually de deep, deep neural networks actually help is basically things like where it's complex. So you have images, you have, say for example, voice, uh, you have, for example, videos. So in these cases, deep neural networks do an excellent job. So this is, these are cases where it actually could actually add potential value because you have a lot of inputs. You have, say, uh, photos from, say, Instagram, or you have photos from Flickr, which you would want to train a neural network, and you would want to deploy it onto, say, your mobile phone. In those cases, deep neural networks are going to be really, really helpful. So this is, these are cases when it's genuinely a reasonably good idea to go for deep neural networks and actually pitch that idea. But in general, do not start, start with that. So in general, uh, I would highly suggest you actually understand the problem first, then see if your data is actually separable, if say how separable it is, what if you can understand the data yourself, and see if you can actually classify, for example, if you have say photos, can you actually classify it yourself? If a human being cannot classify it, a computer cannot do that as well. So don't think that just because a human being can do or cannot do, a computer would probably be able to do. So the analogy is basically if a human being can do, then a computer might be able to do it. So this is where uh, you can actually draw a line. So if you say this is not even possible, then a computer, forget even a computer actually doing that better than a human being. Uh, there are reasons for that, but yeah, of course, in different cases it could work. If, uh, so you, you can bring a particular case and say, hey, a human being could not do, but a computer did that over here. I do agree that uh, there are cases, but in general, as a, a rule of thumb, generally a human being's performance would be the ballpark which you take to actually see whether a computer or a machine learning algorithm could actually solve the problem. So uh, generally that's, that's something to take into note. So let's probably, uh, let's not go into too detail. So I will probably, what I will do is, because I think over point, sometime after some time, this is going to get a bit boring. Uh, what I would rather do is, if you want to go with something, if you want to do, train a neural network yourself, uh, I would highly, I have a, a repository, a, a GitHub repository, which you can train. So uh, we can go over here, I will show you exactly what is happening and how you can actually train. So uh, in this case, I think this is not clear. Um, I'll just increase the size here. 
So on this repository, what I've done is uh, basically I can also post this link if you want to take an image or a screenshot, you can actually take a screenshot over here in case you would want that. Uh, but yeah, so effectively, what this repository tries to do uh, is try to actually introduce you to deep neural networks, uh, to train your own image classification algorithm, to train your own, say, for example, regression algorithm. Um, in this case, we have different notebooks over here. Uh, the first one would be the actual introduction to Colab on Python. I will come to that. Uh, so how many of you have uh, heard about Colab? Collaboratory from Google? Oh, pretty cool. So uh, Colab is actually an excellent tool from Google. And uh, what Colab does is it actually uh, uh, provisions a kernel for you behind the scenes uh, with a GPU or uh, basically um, any of the you know, you know, uh, a CPU as well. And in actually, in one case, you can also provision a TPU for yourself. Uh, there, are, there is an example of uh, how you could actually provision a TPU. Uh, we will come to that later. Uh, but there are some examples in this repository as well that you can actually use to uh, run neural networks on a TPU. On a TPU is basically Google's um, uh, specified own hardware, uh, proprietary hardware that Google actually built ground up to actually uh, specifically for training deep neural networks. Uh, because like I said, back in 2012, uh, what the guys at Stanford and basically at, uh, uh, different universities back in the US did was basically take a, a GPU and then they just repurpose the GPU to do exactly the matrix multiplication we just spoke about. And the GPUs are not really, really built for uh, deep neural networks. So the reason why Google built a TPU is because they, they think it's actually much easier to actually, uh, a, a TPU does a much more fancy way of compute. It actually uses something called a systolic operation, systolic compute, where it actually does waves of compute to actually uh, do the computation, get the data, fetch. And one of the problems the GPU is the bottleneck from the CPU. So this is one of the reasons why GPU, uh, sorry, Google actually built this TPU itself. So let's uh, quickly go into this uh, repository. Uh, to give you an idea of how you can use this repository, it looks like pretty obscure uh, notebooks. What you can do is you can go to Colab. Uh, the interesting thing that you can do with Colab is, uh, so this is Colab. So for people who have not seen Colab before, uh, maybe let me cancel this, let me escape. So Colab is basically, uh, in, to put it in plain terms, it's a Jupyter notebook effectively running on Google's infrastructure. Uh, what you can do is you can run uh, different kernels. You can, in this case, this is a Python kernel behind, effectively allowing you to use a GPU or a TPU to train some algorithm. But in the end, it's basically a compute infrastructure on the cloud, on a browser, effectively. Um, so if you see, basically, uh, yeah, there are code cells and there are com comment cells. So whatever is white, in this case, uh, is basically a comment cell uh, where you can actually add comments and then you can actually see or share this information with people. It is not executable. That's the, to put it simple. And there are Python or this code cells which can be executed. So code cell will typically have this uh, execute or this run uh, button on the left-hand side. And effectively, that will show you, in this case, if you haven't run yet, you will basically see this uh, no number in it. So if you run the cell, you will get a number in the cell as to showing which was the sequence in which it was actually run. So if you run this example, for this is a very simple, because it's Python, uh, it'll simply just run out of the box. It's, uh, Python is interpreted. So effectively, it'll just execute it, and then it'll show the results right below on the cell. So in this case, it's an example where it's actually calculating the seconds in a week. So this is why it actually calculates a second in a day. So it's a very simple example over here. But it's not just for all these uh, simple examples. You can also do something fancy, uh, like plotting data. You can actually visualize data. You can do a lot of things with uh, Jupyter Notebook. Uh, not Jupyter Notebook, but uh, you can do it with Jupyter Notebook, but also with Colabs. Uh, so Google Colab actually lets you uh, train a neural network as well as do simple data exploration as well. So if you want to do uh, understand, uh, say, the distribution of data, you can do that with the Colab. But to give you an idea of how you can use this repository, what you can do is you can actually go to, uh, you can actually say, uh, from the GitHub uh, repository, you can actually click on one of the notebooks. Say, for example, in this case, let me not take this Colab to introduction, but this first neural network. Uh, what you can do is you can copy this uh, URL. So this URL will you will get you copy the URL, paste it over here. So just remove this. Um, uh, what you have to do is remove the GitHub.com. Just replace it with GitHub, and you will effectively be able to run um, this notebook out of the box. So let me show you what that means. Uh, you can open, hmm, yes, leave. 
what you can do is now directly from GitHub, uh, import this notebook without any downloads, any of the nonsense into you. You don't have to run anything on your computer. You can directly source a GitHub repository, a public GitHub repository, that is, into Colab. So you can effectively replace the URL, uh, just paste it in front of the colab.research.google.com, and then remove the github.com and just replace it with GitHub. So that's the simplest uh, way in which you can actually import a notebook into Colab. And effectively, you can start working straight away. Uh, what you can do is, like I said before, uh, you have different things now. Uh, you can now say, OK, let's run this. So yeah, don't, don't worry. I'm, I'm not taking you. It's, it's an open source project, so you can just download everything and run it as well. Uh, but what it's trying to say is that, in this case, so what we will do is uh, we will predict uh, Celsius versus Fahrenheit. So what we will do is uh, we will try to train a neural network to predict, uh, given a Celsius value, what is the Fahrenheit value. Very simple. Uh, so uh, if you, so there is a, a value, you can actually use this to g get the actual value mathematically. But uh, we are fancy, we want to try machine learning. So uh, what we will do is we will try to learn a neural network, which is effectively going to uh, do this prediction for us. So this is just to give you an idea of uh, what uh, TensorFlow can do. So just to ensure uh, what you can do is uh, I would suggest you actually install TensorFlow 2.0. So to give you an idea of how you can do that, uh, you can create a new cell. Uh, so if you have a uh, click on a code cell and then you click on plus code, you will get at this uh, code cell. Uh, just install pip install TensorFlow, TensorFlow GPU, and you say, or TensorFlow GPU hyphen hyphen upgrade. And effectively what this will do behind the scenes is basically it will install TensorFlow with the GPU package uh, onto this uh, repository. So this will effectively upgrade this TensorFlow values and it'll uh, behind the scenes it will install uh, TensorFlow uh, with the GPU value for it. But I, I, technically I think we don't need a GPU here. Let me just cancel this. I'll just install TensorFlow and then upgrade this. Cool, okay. So now that everybody has internet access, uh, so just uh, um, just add a code cell, and then you would be able to run this uh, um, as well. So so you, you, uh, technically what it will do is uh, it will install TensorFlow, and if you run the cell again, then what will happen is you should be able to see uh, that it is actually TensorFlow 2.0. Uh, what I would suggest is whatever greater than 2.0 is better. Uh, it's, it's just that we have some 2.0 is basically the latest uh, version of TensorFlow. Uh, it's highly, it's, it's recommended. Uh, so it, it makes a lot of this TensorFlow training much simpler uh, to use with TensorFlow 2.0 version. You can, of course, use 1.15 as well, no harm. But 2.0 is much more user friendly when it comes to training neural networks. Yes. So this is perfectly fine because it's basically complaining about the fact that it's TensorFlow and Google Colab. At the moment, we only care about TensorFlow. So this is why when this guy, this cell runs, we will know exactly what has happened now. So if this one runs, uh, we are pretty much safe. Uh, we are still at 1.15, which is not good, but you can, there is a solution for this as well. What you can do is go to runtime and just restart runtime. Uh, and you don't have to install TensorFlow again. Uh, instead, what you choose, just run this. So let's see what happens now. Hopefully, it should have installed 2.0. Cool. So that's it. So this is the solution. So generally, uh, if things don't go well, you won't come to this point. Uh, all these errors are basically Colab and TensorFlow and things like that, which are nothing it won't break anything, so it's perfectly fine. So at least at the moment. So in your personal project, in your, say, work project, if this happens, then you might have to see. But at the moment, for us to run this example, it's perfectly fine. This is a kernel which is going to simply spin something and then train a very simple example. It is more than enough. We will come to it when it actually fails. It shouldn't fail anymore. So, so if everybody is good with TensorFlow 2.0, then we can go forward. We can quickly see what we are going to do here. We define our inputs and outputs. So this is what I was talking about. So this is our, the last time we talked, we spoke about WX plus B or the X and the Y values. Here comes the X and the Y. So it's very simple. Your X is basically all these values. 
and your Y is basically these values. So what you're trying to train your neural network is to try to, in a, in a classification case, you will predict whether it's zero to nine, for example, or a cat or a dog. In this case, what you're trying to predict or not predict here, you're trying to basically estimate uh, what would be the value given a Celsius value. So uh, the neural network does not know whether this is Celsius or whatever. It's just trying to look at one value and then it's trying to do another value. And effectively what you want to, the, the middle, the black box to do is to train the neural network to actually predict uh, this values exactly. So what we've done, we've basically defined the inputs and the outputs and let's create the model. Uh, you see, basically, I told you how easy it has become. You don't have to define anything much. You just have to say, hey, I have a TensorFlow Keras layer. I want a dense layer. So what this dense layer does is basically this WX plus B definition. Uh, this adds a single uh, layer of definition, single layer of uh, neural network, and it basically says uh, you have an input, uh, and it's saying your input shape is one. Uh, that's because the one-dimensional data, and it's trying to say, okay, you, ha you want a dense layer, which is going to say, in this case, it's trying to predict one value, so it's going to learn that as well, uh, W and a B, so you have a WX plus B plus a nonlinearity, and you're also going to basically define the model. So it has become as simple as uh, writing the layer values and just compiling the, the model here. And in the end, you basically say, okay, uh, what is the model? You, this is a simple model. You have defined the model, and you can also do something called model.summary, which will effectively say uh, the actual, uh, maybe we can also do that. Let me add a value here. Let's say model.summary. So you see basically Colab is also trying to uh, fill up over here. It's like an IntelliSense, but effectively it will, if you do this, you will be able to see what this neural network is trying to do. It's saying, hey, uh, you have one layer, which is a dense layer. You have the input, which is none. The reason why it's none is because, again, you want to feed batches. And uh, at runtime, you want to feed the batch, so you want to change it anything that you want. So this is why it's none. Uh, and it will try to predict. A per so there are two parameters to be trained. So this is why it's saying there are two trainable parameters, because there is a W and a B. This is why you have two. And it needs to basically train these parameters. There are no non-trainable parameters. You have an input and an output directly. So uh, if you do a model dot fit, you should be able to train this model and then predict how good your uh, values are. So in this case, it already finished training because it's a pretty simple uh, case. And if you see the training as well, it should have gone pretty fast. I sh uh, yeah, and you see it started off well, and then it, uh, it dropped off. It, it's good that it did not go to zero. So it will generally not go to zero because there is always, like I said, there is a randomization and there is always an in, in, in slay, the W and the B values. There is nonlinearity and effectively uh, it, it should not go to zero unless and otherwise it actually can overparameterize and uh, memorize all this information. So let's not go deeper into overfitting and underfitting as well. But if you're interested, we could do that also. Uh, there is an example in this uh, repository which will try to do that as well. And finally, we can do the prediction. Uh, so you effectively, you've uh, taken the inputs, you trained a neural network, and you've also predicted the neural network, or the predicted the values from the neural network. How you predict is you take the value, the model, the, the trained neural network, do a dot predict, and this, this will be the input over here. So if it's 100 degrees Celsius, what is the, uh, say for example, what is the uh, value for uh, the, in, in Fahrenheit, and effectively it should do somewhat close to 212. Yeah, it says 211 dot, 211 dot something, it's not bad. Uh, but again, you see it is not done an exact um, multiplication. It's not figured out the 1.8 and a 32. If you, do the, if you check the coefficients of the neural network, you will see that it has actually learned the biases and the weights as well. Uh, this is where you will see below. So you will also look at the layer weights. And this is where it will tell you, yes. Yes? Ah. Um, I run the exact same step, and I think everything is pretty deterministic, or is it randomized? Yeah, so there is a randomization, yes. There is a, the reason for the randomization, or it's not randomization, because it's, uh, in, in your instance, it's trying to uh, initialize this W and this B value. Um, generally, it'll start with some random value. So this is why there is, it won't, you won't get an exact 1.825089 3 do you? 
So you don't get that. So do you, or do you get the exact same thing? Okay, exactly. So you'll get somewhat around the ballpark. You will get like 1.7 or 1.9, but it's perfectly fine. So you'll be around somewhere on this uh, region and the same case with this as well. So you see our actual value to be learned is 1.8 and 32. It is somewhat around that. So it's about 29 and 1.8. So this is where, uh, neural, this is the reason why a neural network cannot generally go to zero because of the randomization. And every time it's actually trying to like, correct itself, it cannot correct an exact value because it's looking at an approximation. It does not want to, uh, even as a human being, we don't want to actually learn a perfect decision. There is no black or white. We will try to generally say there is a gray, and then we will try to use some context to say whether we want to decide something or not. And in general, a neural network also does pretty much a very similar case. Of course, it was inspired by the brain's neurons. So in some cases, this is why some neurons are excited when it does something. Uh, and we will go into the next uh, notebook, which actually talks about image classification. And we will see why we have something called convolutions and why we have uh, other types of nonlinearities in it. But to sum up, this is effectively what you're doing. You're learning these weights. These are the two things that you want to learn. And you want to see how close they are to the actual values. And in this example, shows exactly what is happening behind the scenes. Without you explicitly telling the neural network that, hey, uh, f is basically 1.8 plus 32. But you are basically saying, these are all the inputs. These are all the outputs. Why don't you try to predict it yourself and tell me what the values are in the end? And the neural network tries to do uh, some sort of uh, trial and error. And then it comes up to this close to this 1.8 and this 32 value somewhere there. So if you do train longer, you will be able to come even closer to this 1.8 and 32. Uh, if you do very well, you will be like 1.8101, something like that. So it will be very close to this actual value itself. But in general, yeah, so this is one of the ways in which you can debug your neural network as well. So you will be able to extract all the, in this case, you will see, just for fun, you can actually do more and then see what actually happens. So what will happen if you have so many variables and then you or trained it for 500 epochs. So like I said, you have an epoch is basically one time when the neural network sees all the values. So in this case, if you do well, you still get 211.774. It's not, it's close enough, but it's still basically, that's all you can do with the neural network. So even if you over parameterize, where you actually learn so many new things, you actually, uh, you have three layers, you have non-linearities and things like that. And even with so many things, uh, this neural network is not able to do much. Uh, Actually, in this case, there are no non-linearities. We will come to that later. But this is one of the reasons why it cannot actually do uh, a complex decision boundary in this case. So this actually is doing a very simple uh, decision boundary. In this case, the linear um, uh, understanding is trying to, because we are just getting a wx and a plus and a b, uh, which is uh, 1.8 times c plus 32. And this is why, in this case, we don't need a non-linearity at all. But in general, we will not know this. Uh, out of the box. For example, image classification is not directly uh, an affine transformation. It's not just a linear matrix multiplication to come to, uh, for example, another way. You have to do nonlinearities. And we will see the examples why these nonlinearities are actually needed. So, um, if there are anything, any other questions we can discuss. If there are not, probably should we have a break? Yeah, maybe we'll take like five or 10 minutes break and we can come back to uh, training another neural network, which is probably a lot more deeper. At the moment, we just trained one layer neural network. We'll come back to train an image classification and then we'll see what happens there.